If Haman was an angry man, I think you will find that Mester was an even angrier one. He started from very different origins than those of Haman. Haman was born in 1730, the Mester in 1753 in uh, Chambéry, in the Savoie. He was son of a man who had been raised to the rank of a count because he was president of the uh, court of the Kingdom of Sardinia, in particular in, its, in the uh, city of Chambéry. Uh, the general notion of Mester is that he is a man of ancient lineage, an aristocrat, an enemy to the revolution, a great defender of the church and the state against the abominable Jacobin crimes. This is, uh, in a sense, perfectly valid, except that he was not a man of ancient lineage. Uh, late, the biographies of the 20th century, though not those of the 19th, have finally revealed the fact that although his father was certainly raised to the dignity of being a count, his great-grandfather and his, his grandfather were drapers. This is a fact which never emerged during any of the biographies of Mester in the 19th and even early 20th century. But, and although it may be an irrelevant fact, comparatively speaking, it does, I think, perhaps throw some light upon the particular passion with which he defends the order to which he was but lately raised. This is, sometimes occurs in the case of novi hominies like Cicero and Burke, whom in other respects he resembles. He had a very uneventful life as a young man. That is to say, he pursued the normal course of a young Savoyard aristocrat. He was, uh, studied the law. He studied theology, in which he took little interest. He studied Latin and Greek. He joined a Masonic Lodge, which in those days was a thing not incompatible with belonging to the Roman Church, and throughout his life defended Freemasonry, even though it had been uh, excommunicated. It had been denounced by papal bulls as early as the 1730s, on the ground that although what the Freemasons and the Illuminists taught was not Christian orthodoxy, or indeed in certain respects Christianity at all, Yet, it was a movement which was extremely useful against hard-shelled atheism. It was something which, because it emphasized the spiritual nature of man and dwelt on the immortality of the soul and of life after death, as it might be said, softened up the soul for the approaches of true religion, and therefore should not be condemned in the round and co completely intolerant way in which the Roman Church condemned it. It was a useful instrument towards the truth, and not, as was supposed by the Roman priesthood, a rival religion. However this may be, he belonged to a, young, to a group of young aristocrats, one of whose duties it was to give um, last comforts to the condemned in Chambéry. And this probably did mean that he was present at a good many executions. Uh, he dwells on blood and execution a good deal in his works, and some of his biographers suppose that this may be due to early memories of such scenes. At any rate, he had a perfectly conventional life until the outbreak of the French Revolution in 89, which he welcomed in a moderate sort of way. By 91, he was no longer in a welcoming mood. The revolution spread to the comparatively liberal and progressive kingdom of Savoy, which had abolished feudalism already in the 1770s, and was one of those cautious, liberal, not very extreme kingdoms, which, broadly speaking, rather like Switzerland in the 19th century, which was a good deal in advance of the more reactionary institutions of its time, though a good deal behind the more liberal ones. And uh, when the revolution began to spread into Savoy, which it ultimately inundated, uh, the master emigrated, went to Lausanne, then went to Venice, then went to Cagliari in Sardinia, where the court was, to which he was, of which he was official, and finally, I think partly because of the intransigence of his views, he, pro he began producing monarchist pamphlets almost immediately, which although they were very counter-revolutionary and extremely violent in their defense of the monarchy, nevertheless said things which the emigres didn't wish to hear, such as the fact that the revolution was irrevocable, that the attempt to um, try and go back to a pre-revolutionary status was like trying to exhaust the Lake of Geneva by means of collecting its water in bottles and other things of this type, which were regarded on the whole as rather uh, unwelcome um, to the not very progressive, not very bright, not very um, advanced uh, court, uh, courtiers and aristocrats uh, collected round um, King Victor Emmanuel of Savoy in Cagliari. 
At any rate, he just thought he was an uncomfortable customer. He was brilliant, he was an ally, but paradoxical, sharp, overcritical, and liable to make remarks which caused offence at court. And so he decided to send him as far away as possible. And he was sent as Sardinian minister to St. Petersburg, in which he spent a large part of his life, in which he uh, accumulated a good deal of interesting observation about the life of the Russians, like the court, the army, the church, the customs of the Russians. He published, he published a good deal of this in his diplomatic memoirs and also in notes which he used to send privately to various friends in the Russian aristocracy, all of which were subsequently used by persons interested in this particular period in Russian history, notably Tolstoy. Now, the importance of the master lies in the fact that he was certainly the most brilliant and the most polemical of the critics of the philosophy that underlay the French Revolution. As you may imagine, the French Revolution produced a great crop of analysis of its causes and effects. It promised liberty and equality, and although it undoubtedly did promote this in the case of certain sections of the population, it was difficult to maintain by, let us say, 1807 or 1808, that human happiness, at any rate, on the part of most of those who desired it, had conspicuously gone up as a result of the revolution. Certainly institutions had changed, some had become richer, others poorer, some freer, others more enslaved. A new regime, the Napoleonic regime, was in charge. But there was a great deal of what might be called painful reappraisal of, first of all, the causes of the revolution, and secondly, the reasons for that failure, both on the part of those who regretted this failure and on the part of those who exulted in it. The liberals attributed the failure to the untraining of human passions, to the terror. People like Saint-Simon maintained that it was due to the fact that while the revolution was proceeding quite peacefully until 91, then the mob took control and proceeded to exterminate those enlightened intellectuals in whose hands alone the revolution would have been safe and its fruits would have been preserved. Socialists and communists maintained that there was tremendous blindness on the part of the makers of the French Revolution to the social and economic structure of society and social and economic causality in general. And that because Robespierre had not pressed on with his egalitarian laws and because the laws of property had not sufficiently been touched, the revolution turned out to be a failure. Um, there are various other interpretation explanations you may imagine. Hegelians maintained that this was due to an inadequate understanding of the general march of history and of the relationship of facts and ideas. Catholic, Catholic Church maintained, and Mestre maintained with it, that the true cause of the failure of the French Revolution was the rupture of the past, the departure from the word of God, heresy, the fact that there was a particular kind of life which had been enshrined in tradition and enshrined in the teachings of the Catholic Church. And by breaking this and mutinying and rebelling against it, man had put himself beyond the pale, had become an outlaw, and was duly punished by God with such scourges as Robespierre and Napoleon. Now, if this had, all been, if this had been all what the Master said, he would not have been a very notable or interesting thinker. But he goes much further than this. He has, is determined to take to pieces the main theses of the Enlightenment, in particular as preached by the French encyclopedists, and to show their shallowness and insubstantiality. And he begins by uh, considering the proposition that man is rational and that man is, uh, seeks happiness. First of all, the proposition, man is rational. He says, whence do they derive this proposition? They derive this proposition from a study of nature. Therefore, we must apply ourselves first to the study of nature and then to the study of the alleged rationality of man. Well, how do they study nature? These men study nature by making analogies between nature and mathematics and nature and their own a priori philosophies. For Rousseau and for other thinkers, nature is fundamentally a kind of seamless harmony which man um, departs from, that all human misery is due to the fact that human beings don't understand the harmonious nature of the reality in which they're situated. Animals and objects obey natural laws because they cannot avoid it, because they're not conscious, and therefore unable to rebel. Man, on the other hand, because he has been given the boon of free will by misusing it, 
is able to alienate himself, is able to tear himself from nature, and the task then is to restore the broken equilibrium and somehow to restore man to the understanding of his own nature, its proper purposes, and how these naturally blend into the harmony of nature which science and other uh, means of cognition are able to uh, penetrate. How my, uh, Mester says there is, uh, these people look at mathematics and these people look within their own minds. Perhaps it would be more useful if they actually looked at history itself, or perhaps some of the sciences closer to man, such as zoology. If you look at zoology, this picture of a peaceful nature, harmonious with itself, this picture of someone sitting by the rill of a stream which Rousseau paints, away from the corrupt sophistication of the cities, listening to the whistling of the wind in the reeds and to the peaceful grazing of cows, and therefore able to get himself into a state of moral tranquility, is not entirely valid. Nature is um, a world in which every animal rips every other animal to pieces. Nature is a world in which there is nothing but bloodshed, fearful um, struggle goes on between um, various races of animals, even between those of plants. In fact, nature is one enormous slaughterhouse. Let me read you a typical passage by Mester on the subject. It serves to give you the general qualities, if you speak of what might be called Mester's imagination. He says, if you consider what nature is impartially, and without the particular prejudices and spectacles, particular sets of spectacles which these shallow men uh, had inherited from persons principally interested in such non-human subjects as logic and algebra, what you will see is this. In the whole vast dome of living nature, there reigns an open violence, a kind of prescriptive fury which arms all the creatures to their common doom. As soon as you leave the inanimate kingdom, you find the decree of violent death inscribed on the very frontiers of life. You feel it already in the vegetable kingdom. From the great catalpa to the humblest herb, how many plants die and how many are killed? But from the moment you enter the animal kingdom, this law is suddenly in the most dreadful evidence. A power of violence at once hidden and palpable has in each species appointed a certain number of animals to devour the others. Thus, there are insects of prey, birds of prey, fishes of prey, quadrupeds of prey. There is no instant of time when one creature is not being devoured by another. Over all these numerous races of animals, man is placed, and his destructive hand spares nothing that lives. He kills to obtain food, and he kills to clothe himself. He kills to adorn himself, he kills in order to attack, and he kills to defend himself. He kills to instruct himself, and he kills to amuse himself. He kills to kill. Proud and terrible king, he wants everything and nothing resists him. In French, this becomes a kind of litany. Il tue pour se nourrir, il tue pour se vêtir, il tue pour se parer, il tue pour s'attaquer, il tue pour se défendre, il tue pour s'instruire, il tue pour s'amuser, il tue pour tuer. Roi superbe terrible, il a besoin de tout, rien ne lui résiste. From the lamb he tears its guts and makes its harp resound. From the wolf his most deadly tooth to polish his pretty works of art. From the elephant his skin to make a whip for his child. His table is covered with corpses. And who in this general carnage will exterminate him, man? Who will exterminate man himself? Himself. It is man who is charged with the slaughter of man. Thus is accomplished the great law of the violent destruction of living creatures. The whole earth, perpetually steeped in blood, is nothing but a vast altar upon which all that is living must be sacrificed without end, without measure, without pause, until the consummation of things, until evil is extinct, until the death of death. This is really Mester's famous and terrible vision of life. And his violent preoccupation with blood and death really does belong to a very different world from the world to which he's usually attributed, to the world of Burke, whom he admired, to the world of the English conservatives, whom he's supposed to have read, a very different world from the world of the slow, mature wisdom of the Burke's landed gentry, or the deep peace of the country houses, great and small, or the eternal society of the quick and the dead, secure from the turbulence and the miseries of those less fortunately situated. It's equally far from the world of the mystics and the illuminists, amongst whom he spent his youth. Well, if this is the, his view of nature, then it's not very surprising that you should say that man is fundamentally not really made for peace. That if you look at the wars of extermination, at the fearful carnage with which human history is filled, it is difficult to say that man is by nature peaceful and that man is by nature benevolent. 
But it is said that man is by nature rational. Let us consider this proposition too, says the master. Consider the institutions, for example, by which man is governed. Consider, for example, the institution of marriage. Nothing is more irrational than, than the marriage, says master. Why should a man choose a woman with whom to live for the rest of his life when his, attraction, when his attention might easily be distracted by other persons more attractive to him in later life? Nevertheless, marriage is the one base, the one fundamental institution upon which human society is founded, and all attempts at creating societies founded upon free love have toppled. Consider the institution of monarchy. What is more irrational or absurd than that the son of a king, even a good king, should succeed him because he is his son? A wise king may have a stupid son, a good king may have an abominable son. And there is no reason for supposing that the children of good men, or of strong men, or of useful men, will have the same qualities themselves. Consequently, it is a far more rational arrangement, for example, to have such a system as you have in Poland, where you have the liberum veto, where you don't have hereditary succession, where the nobles must agree upon who is to be king. The result of which is that France was governed for 66, by 66 kings, some good, some bad, but mostly efficient, mostly capable, and is certainly the fairest kingdom upon the face of the earth. Whereas Poland, with its rational system, is plunged into constant turbulence and has collapsed before the very eyes of the civilized world in a welter of blood and chaos. So much, then, for the stability and reliability of rational institutions. <laughs> this is the typical kind of language Mester uses. These are the paradoxes which he urges. I try to give you a sample of these just to indicate the kind of thing which made him rather unpopular, the court at Cagliari. Although the moral uh, the moral of all this was the pro-monarchist, the moral of all this was in favor of irrationality, the church, tradition, faith, against reason, analysis, light, perfectibil perfectibilism, and so on. Nevertheless, the particular examples which he gave and the particular tone in which he said it undoubtedly did rattle these rather conventional men. <laughs> now, uh, the, he goes on and he says, if stability is what is wanted, and stability is wanted, for without stability society cannot exist, if stability what is wanted, then the worst possible foundation upon which society could conceivably rest is what our 18th century philosophers urge upon us, namely reason. Reason means argument. Reason means some kind of um, construction on the part of rational beings of such a kind as other rational beings are able to criticize using exactly the same weapons. Now what man makes, man can mar. If you really want a stable foundation for society, then the most shaky foundation upon which you can place it is that of unaided human reason. Because even though you may prove that one particular kind of institution is good, or even the best, another man cleverer than you tomorrow will disprove it. Anything which argument puts up, argument will pull down. And therefore nothing is less stable than things which rely upon so precarious a foundation as reason, because one reason is constantly toppled by another. The only foundation which is ultimately stable is something which cannot be reached by destructive forces. Re reasoning, analysis, pulverizes. This is an old Berkian argument, and this is something which Harman would certainly have agreed to. Reason analyzes, it takes to pieces. Anything which is taken to pieces ceases to be mysterious, becomes clear, and as a result of becoming clear, sometimes falls into familiarity and thus contempt. Therefore, the only way in which you can really secure a solid basis for government, which nobody will ever be able to shake, is by making it impervious to reason. How is this done? This is done by founding societies upon foundations so dark, so mysterious, and so terrifying <laughs> that anyone who dares approach them will find himself subject most immediately to the most hideous and enormous penalties. The only societies which have lasted are societies created by priests in which the, the, the people have been taught a series of frightening myths whereby any kind of questioning of the foundations of society was itself regarded as sinful and about to bring about punishment. The only way, the only, the only laws which have lasted amongst mankind are laws whose roots and sources are not remembered. Laws whose roots and sources are remembered are usually bad laws, or at least laws which somebody wants to change. Only custom is the foundation 
of our life. Custom and the dark, irrational sphere which nothing must be allowed to approach. Therefore, authority must be blind. Once you allow people to argue about the basis of authority, once you allow people like Locke to discuss things like contract or things like the justification of this or that form of government, you are done for. The only governments which have really persisted and been solid are governments which do not permit discussion. Those are the governments which are on the whole the most stable. And he goes on from there to argue that that is what man fundamentally craves. We are told, he says, that man is born to freedom. At least Monsieur Rousseau says that man is born to freedom. And never then Monsieur Rousseau wonders why it is that man who is born to freedom nevertheless is everywhere in chains. That, says Mester, is as if you were to say, why is it that sheep who are born carnivorous nevertheless everywhere in nibble grass? <laughs> man, if you, if you consider the, 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 master, the, master, the master's pleasantry, the master's jokes are of, are of very um, high quality, I may say. I shall, produce, <laughs> I shall produce another one, I shall produce one in due course, and you will see it with a man gifted with a considerable ironical intelligence. He, was, he says that when you say man is born to freedom, what does this mean? When you study fishes, when you study animals, you simply study what these animals do, what these animals are. You don't ask yourself what these animals would like to be, because you don't know. In the case of man, you don't study the actual history of man. If you study the actual history of man, you will discover that what men desire is security, what men desire is stability, what men desire is authority, what men desire is obedience. The last thing they desire is freedom. As soon as they're given freedom, everything crumbles and topples. Take monarchy versus democracy. Well, monarchy, as we see, is already irrational enough. Yes, there have been glorious democracies. The Athenian democracy was undoubtedly a magnificent phenomenon in human history. And how long did it last and how much we had to pay for it afterwards? That is, roughly speaking, a mess of plate. That democracies, a particularly very clear democracy, is the kind of thing which human beings cannot bear upon their shoulders. The weight is too great. He says, if you really wish to study human nature, consider actual human behavior instead of ideal human behavior as the 18th century appears to have done. Consider this, for example. Consider, supposing a visitor were to come to you from Mars, or the Moon, I think he says, the Moon, and supposing you were to present two individuals to him, and you were to say about one of these individuals that he did occasionally kill other human beings, but he did it very seldom. He did it without any pleasure to himself. He did it as a pure duty, and the human beings whom he killed were usually murderers, or parricides, or matricides, or perjurers, or other abandoned criminals who were a menace to society. That is one of these individuals. The other individual who presented was a man who killed with a great deal of enthusiasm, killed persons who were perfectly innocent, and killed them in enormous quantities instead of merely killing them perhaps once in five or once in ten years. You will find that the first of these individuals is the executioner, and the second of these individuals is a soldier. And the reputation of soldiers is very different from that of executioners. So much for human rationality, he says. So much, so much for the proposition that human beings um, accept the principles of the Enlightenment. Here is the executioner who is a useful public servant who does what he does with utmost reluctance. And here is a soldier who kills with lust and with enthusiasm people certainly every bit as innocent as himself. And these are the people most deeply respected in our society. Why should this be? He consider, he says the following. Consider, for example, what people like and what they dislike, historically speaking. N never mind about what human beings should be or could be, or you would like to see them as. Peter the Great, who was one of the great reformers of, of history. Peter the Great, um, when he sent thousands and hundreds of thousands of Russians into battles and constant defeats, never had the slightest difficulty in doing so. They marched to battle and they died like sheep, perfectly obediently and without raising any protest. There was not the slightest sign of mutiny. There are very, there are very few mutinies amongst marching armies. And yet these men had no idea why they were marching, why they were killing those whom they were going to kill. Certainly they had no personal hostility to the, to the, to, to the enemy, who was certainly as innocent, as noble, and as honorable as they were. On the other hand, it, when he tried to shave the beards of the boyars, there was a riot. When in the 18th century there was an attempt to reform the calendar, there was practically a French mutiny. 
That is the kind of thing which people mind about. Beards, calendars, yes. Death, not in the least. <laughs> and these are the people whom you wish to represent as rational, peace-loving, enlightened, illuminated, persons capable of governing themselves, persons capable of taking part in their own self-government, potential Democrats, potential liberals, persons whom Monsieur Voltaire and Monsieur Rousseau wish to entrust the government to. That is, roughly speaking, a master sermon. He continues. He says that what men really want, if you really ask yourself what they want instead of what they ought to want, is not what all the benevolent philosophers of the 18th century said they wanted, namely to live together in society for the purpose of living a happier life together. For example, cooperation. For example, mutual self-help. The general conventional views after all the 18th century was that the purpose of society was to ensure reciprocal mutual benefits for human beings which they wouldn't be able to obtain for themselves. This is what Aristotle said, this is what St. Thomas, in whom Nestor officially believed, said, and this is what a number of other thinkers with high degree of plausibility have said, are saying, and I hope will go on saying. Mester said this is not true. What people really like, or at least among the things that people really like, is collective self-immolation. If, if you give people an altar upon which to sacrifice themselves, they rush headlong, and without much thinking of what it is they sacrifice themselves to. That is what makes wars possible. Let me read you his passage on war, and you will see, roughly speaking, the kind of thing that is meant. What inconceivable magic is it which makes a man always ready at the first beat of the drum to go without resisting, often with even a kind of eagerness, in order to blow to pieces on the field of battle his brother, who has done him no wrong, and who on his side advances to subject him to the same fate if he can. Men who shed tears if they have to kill a chicken, kill on the battlefield without a qualm. They do so purely for the common good. Repressing their human feelings is a painful, altruistic duty. Executioners kill a very few guilty men, parricides, forgers, and the like. Soldiers kill thousands of guiltless men indiscriminately, blindly, with wild enthusiasm. Yet, man is born to love. He is compassionate, just, and good. He sheds tears for others, and such tears give him pleasure. He invents stories to make him weep. Whence, then, this furious desire for war and slaughter? Why does man plunge into the abyss, embracing with a passion that which inspires him, officially at any rate, with such loathing? Why do men who revolt over such trivial issues as attempts to change the calendar and so on allow themselves to be slaughtered? There is only one valid answer. Man's desire to immolate themselves is as fundamental as their desire for self-preservation and happiness. War is a terrible and eternal law of the world. Indefensible on the rational plane, it is mysteriously and irresistibly attractive. At the level of reasoned utilitarianism, war is, of course, everything which it's thought to be, and worse. Nevertheless, it has governed human history, and this merely shows the inadequacy of rationalist explanations. What then must be done? What must be done is that man must be governed by some kind of discipline which gives vent to these irrational impulses which nothing can cure. What the master really does believe and this is something which is genuinely not a very 18th century, nor even a very 17th century view. And there is, in some sense, the elements, the earth calls for blood. He really is a man who is given to a kind of sadistic fantasy in this respect. He feels that the whole of the world is filled with slaughter and the sounds of slaughter. That the dark and irrational forces move men, and to treat them as if they were creatures of light, to treat them as if they were rational or as if they were benevolent, is simply a, an empirical error, and anyone who does so is likely to lead men to their doom. Therefore, what must be done is to govern men in a manner which prevents them from ripping each other to pieces. He sees man with a more than Hobbesian pessimism, as a kind of ape-like, tiger-like creature, for no evident reason ready to rip his uh, other men to pieces, out of greed, out of ambition, out of general irrational impulse, and just for, the, for its own sake, simply out of aggressive instinct. And the only way in which this can be prevented is by placing over him a degree of harsh authority, 
on the part of men who understand other human beings, which will imprison him and chain him. It will put some kind of, as it were, armor, a sort of a, 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 a straitjacket upon this potential lunatic, which will prevent him from venting these terrible and self-destructive desires. That, I think, is his picture of man. And he thinks the French Revolution let loose these things. Now, his attitude towards the French Revolution is unorthodox and quite interesting in that regard. Of course he disapproves of it. Of course he thinks the French Revolution is a great punishment sent by God upon men who have departed from the traditional discipline, the hierarchy of the Roman Church, which kept people in a relative degree of order and prevented the worst kind of barbarism from occurring. Nevertheless, he says that power must always be respected because power is the only thing which stops people from disintegrating. He says it's always something which stops human being. It may be conscience, it may be custom, it may be the assassin's dagger, it may be the papal tiara. But it is always something, never himself, he says, never himself. And therefore the idea of self-control, which is preached by the rationalists, the idea of self-coercion is a contradiction in terms for him. Coercion must come from outside. Man is a, what he calls a theomorph and a theomach. Man is a monstrous centaur who both fights God and is made in his image. He is made in his image and to that extent he is rational and good. But he fights him because there are black instincts within him which nothing will ever finally quell. Original sin which nothing can ultimately exterminate. Man doesn't know what he wants. Man wants what he doesn't want. Man doesn't want what he wants. Man wants to want and cannot achieve it. He feels, says Master, within himself a force more powerful than himself. If he is wise, he cries out and says, who will rescue me from this? If he's stupid, he gives in and calls his weakness happiness. That is, roughly speaking, the kind of epigram in which the Master sought to summarize mankind. Now, if this is so, if this is what men are like, then, of course, they need strong government. That is perfectly clear. And what kind of strong government must they have? Well, the kind of strong government which they must have is a government given to them in some irrational fashion. As I say, something which reason cannot reach to, which reason cannot disintegrate, something which is sufficiently terrifying to keep people in a condition of permanent obedience. Our philosophers, he says, wish us to look at human nature as it truly is. And whom do they invite us to inspect? Why, of course, the savage, the noble savage, the primitive man not corrupted by wicked, civilized institutions. Savages are among the refuse of mankind, he suddenly observes. To say that we ought to imitate savages, to say that there is something about savages or about primitives which in some way is superior to human beings, is again to run against the most obvious facts of psychology and history. If you look at savages, you will see that they are simply failures of the divine creation. They are simply debris, so to speak, of, of, of the divine process. Savages are drunken and they are barbarous. All they do is to scalp one another, eviscerate one another, and live in the most detestable, commit the most detestable crimes, and are subject to the most detestable vices, and there are no qualities amongst them which any civilized person could possibly envy. He then begins to quote Montesquieu. Savages, savages are people who, when the good missionaries give them a cart and an ox, um, burn the cart in order to roast the ox. <laughs> they, they, this, is, this is an example that you take from Montesquieu. They cut down the tree in order to eat its fruit. That is what savages do. All they want of us, he says, says the master, is powder uh, to, to, kill, to, kill one, uh, to kill us and fire water to kill themselves. That is what savages want. And these are the persons whom we are invited to emulate. If you look at their language, you will find that this is not, those are not the great primitive roots of language about which so many 18th century thinkers have been enthusiastic and 17th century ones also. They are simply the corrupt remains of total collapse of human civilization. These are, as it were, the failures of the divine process 
the sad cases which the good fathers, the good priests, the good missionaries have not told us the truth about. These men are kind, these men are good, these men are Christian. They don't want to reveal the hideous truth about the natives whom they find. And we have no business to be deceived by the fact that these charitable fathers don't wish to reveal the fact that the savages against whom, whom they come across are amongst the lowest and most detestable um, human creatures living on earth. That is so much for primitive man. Now, what else are we expected to emulate? If we're expected to emulate democracies, we need only to look at history at their fate. When he was in Russia, he began giving advice on the government of Russia, because he had very little to do uh, as the representative of uh, the Sardinian king. The Sardinian king was, after all, um, a, a pensioner of England and Russia. He was an enemy to Napoleon, who didn't actually invade Sardinia, though he took away Savoy and Turin. Savoy and the Piedmont. And therefore, as Napoleon had an ambassador at the Russian court also, the ambassador of his enemy, the King of Sardinia, had a rather complicated relationship to him. He was rather like, in the last war, a goalist ambassador in the presence of the official ambassador of Vichy France. And that is why the, the Metsu didn't have much diplomatic business to, pros to prosecute. On the other hand, he was a man of considerable charm, erudition, and, and uh, intelligence, obviously. And all the Russian memoirs of the time say what an agreeable and delightful person he was. And he was a great converter to the Church of Rome. He must have converted more noble ladies in the Russian court than anyone could have done before or after him. Indeed, he did it on so formidable a scale that in the end, in 1817, uh, Alexander I requested his withdrawal because it was thought that this was interfering with the business of government too much. But at any rate, um, he used to send private notes to various Russian noblemen, and indeed Alexander himself, about uh, Russian affairs. And he is, so far as the government is concerned, the typical piece of advice which he offers is something of this kind. He says, man is corrupt, man is uh, sinful, man is a cruel and vicious creature who can only just be stopped from destroying the others by uh, the two institutions which have kept Europe comparatively peaceful, comparatively stable, have been the institution of selfhood and the church itself. The church enunciated dogmatic propositions which human beings broke at their peril. He wrote a little tract defending the Inquisition, uh, in the mess, which was quite a brave thing to do in about 1810, on the ground that the Inquisition was at least better than fratricidal wars. The Inquisition did at least prevent what he supposed to be religious wars, say, in Spain. And paints the Inquisition in somewhat, in somewhat rosy colors. He says the Inquisition takes a man away and by reasoning with him, sometimes applying a little violence, returns him, <laughs> returns him to the bosom of his family as a reformed Christian. If this had not been done, he would have gone to the extremes to which his unbridled reason would have pushed him. He would have formed a party. He would have led a movement and hundreds of thousands of people would have died in some fearful slaughter as a result. Consequently, the Inquisition is a force for peace. Now, religion then and serfhood are the two anchors upon which stable human society rests. Now, in Russia, you still have, of course, serfhood, but the church is to stood in respect. He says the Roman church, when it acquired the degree of authority, which made it truly the arbiter of European fortunes, when the Pope really became the leader of Christendom, and a great deal of reverence and awe was owed to the Roman Church, and they established a solid discipline, was able, because it was Christian and because it was good, to abolish serfdom, because one anchor proved enough. But in your country, the priests are drunken and ignorant, the bishops have no learning and no authority, and therefore your clerical establishment is despised by the people and there's no moral and no political authority. You can't lean on that. Therefore, the only anchor you have for preventing your ship from going out to the high seas and being broken is, of course, the surf system. I know, he says, that people are constantly recommending you on economic and on humanitarian grounds to abolish serfhood, but this would be fatal. If you abolished serfhood, chaos would result. You would pass directly from the condition of your present barbarism to a condition of anarchy. It would not take long, he says, for a few Pugachovs, as he calls them, that's to say a few mutinous mutineers from the universities, supported by indolence and stupidity at home and criminal conspiracies 
on the part of the terrible sect abroad, the sect that never sleeps. I shall tell you in a moment who they are. It will take very little time to, for, for these people to topple your entire kingdom once the authority of the serf system was gone, once authority was gone. And he says the Russians are extraordinary people. Nobody desires as ardently and as passionately as the Russians. If you lock up a Russian desire in a fortress, the fortress will blow up. Your people desire science. Nothing is more fatal. Scientists are persons who put everything in doubt. Scientists are persons who analyze. Scientists are persons who disintegrate. We go back to, once again to Harman and the disintegration of the living flesh of life and the terrible corrosive rays of analytical science. Scientists are persons who, of all people, and as everyone has always known, know least about human nature. To put scientists in charge of any human institution is to guarantee its doom. The great governing people of the earth, the Jews, the Spartans, and the Romans, despise science. When the Romans wanted science, they bought Greeks, who were their scientists for them. <laughs> if the Romans knew that if they tried to be scientists themselves, they would merely make themselves ridiculous. And the same stand is true of the Spartans, and the same is true of the Jews. These are the great races who already have established memorable human institutions on earth. Nobody has ever been as grand as that. These are the people you must emulate. And whom do we have here? You have German Protestants and German scientists who seek employment in your court and in your schools, in your universities. Why do these people come? These people come because they are a shiftless element. These people come because they are not happy at home. Persons of good character who possess property, believe in law and order, and are virtuous citizens do not immigrate. Persons, well, persons who immigrate have something wrong with them. And by allowing all these immigrants, by allowing all these persons who are evidently not happy at home and who are, so to speak, fidgety and unable to um, establish this at home, you are simply importing a disintegrating element which in the end will prove the undoing of your great empire. I have spoken to a prince of Germany who reg regretted the fact that various mutinous freethinkers were leaving his dominions, not because they were leaving his dominions, as because of the terrible damage which they would do to the dominions of his cousin, the Emperor of Russia. Well, this was the kind of advice which, which Mester gave. And he goes further than that, and he says, I know that there is a desire for science and enlightenment everywhere, but if you want stability, if you want peace, if you want order, if you want authority, if you want something which every state needs a minimum of, then my advice to you is try and freeze it up. Don't let it go too far forward. I know it can't be stopped indefinitely, but at least you might slow it down. And this piece of advice was literally adopted by certain Russian statesmen towards the end of the 19th century. The phrase, freeze it up, was not irrelevantly used. They all argued, so to speak, that the causes of uh, unrest and the causes of disintegration among European states, the causes of the general uh, materialism and, and, and political instability of the bourgeois republics of the West was largely due to this awful, uncensored free thought which proceeded among them. And therefore, in Russia, they did, they did their best, as we know, to try and slow down the process which they themselves, rather pessimistically supposed, could not be held up indefinitely. But that, at any rate, is Mester's typical advice. He is quite interesting on a number of other topics as well. For example, language, which brings him into line with Harman and similar thinkers. He says, if you want to know where the repository of tradition lies, if you want to know where wisdom truly is, it is, of course, in language. Language encapsulates, language enshrines the whole tradition, all the, so to speak, accumulated wisdom of an irrational kind of our society and our race. Um, not any kind of language, of course. The people who he most detested were, of course, the encyclopedists. He says, Monsieur Condorcet wants an international language, so that scientists of one country might the better be able to understand the science of another. But an international language would shed precisely those peculiarities, precisely that accumulation of what might be called local, provincial, historical, um, accretion, which gives each language its unique quality and produces those words which shape our minds, which shape education, which shape us into that tradition, on, along those traditional lines uh, along which uh, natural development of human beings and societies must lie, if they are to be traditional, if they are to be peaceful, if they are to have regard to their own past, if they are not to be left 
without ideals and without principles. And that is why they must learn Latin, not because it's a clear language, but on the contrary, because it, it has a huge accumulation of superstition and prejudice, particularly medieval Latin, in it, which therefore acts as a kind of shield against too much disintegrating influence by reason trying to make its way in from without. This is precisely the kind of defense which Burke put up for prejudice and for um, superstitions, or mainly for prejudice. Namely, here are things which have lasted in time. Here are things which have held up against the corrosive influence of criticism. These are the things to cling on to. This is the skin which we have historically formed. This is the bark of the tree. If we strip off the bark, no matter how unsightly it may appear, the tree will perish. And this is the great defense of tradition, superstition, prejudice, irrationality, and again these crooked alleyways of life to which Harman was so attached, and which the master in his own rather different way also defends. And he says, if we listen to what the philosophers say about language, some very peculiar things emerge. You ask M. Kondiak, for example, what are the origins of language? Well, of course, M. Kondiak says, like everything else, it is a product of the division of labor. This is simply a utilitarian device invented by people for the purpose of expressing themselves. What are we to think, says Mester, that the first generation of men said ba, and the second generation of men said be, that the Assyrians invented the nominative and the Medes invented the genitive. <laughs> this is a very typical sort of Mestrian epigram on, on that particular subject. If that is not so, if this is not the way in which human society proceeds, if this is not done by conscious rationalism, by conscious division of labor, by people already illuminated from the beginning, simply seeking to build some kind of life in terms of some kind of utility or in terms of some kind of search for common happiness, which Mester profoundly believes not to be the rooted in the psychology of men. If that is not so, then what are we to think of human society? And he again comes back to two propositions, two eternal propositions. One, that the source of authority must be dark impenetrable and uncriticizable, that anything which is allowed to be, if questions are allowed to be asked, if you say why this institution and an answer is given, and then you say what about this answer and another answer is given, and you ask about well, the why of the why of the why of the why, this is an indefinite process, an infinite process, and in the course of this infinite process everything topples and falls. Therefore darkness must protect the institutions of mankind, that is proposition number one. Proposition number two is that we must never allow, which follows from the first, is we must never allow corrosive persons to penetrate into our midst. This is the sect, la sect qui ne dort jamais. This is the sect which made the French Revolution. Who are these people? Jacobins, socialists, liberals, scientists, Protestants, Jansenists, perfectibilians, Jews. Freemasons, atheists, free thinkers, the, those who made the French Revolution, those who made the American Revolution. These are the people who in some way must be put down. If they are not put down, we are lost. Because all society rests upon authority, and these people call authority into question. All society re rests upon the curbing of reason, because if we don't curb reason, reason will destroy us. And then there follows the famous passage about the executioner, which is, I suppose, the most famous passage in the whole of the Master's works in the book which is called the Soiree de Saint Petersburg, at Petersburg Evenings, in which, in some symbolic sense, he tries to convey to you what it is that society really rests on. It's an extremely exaggerated passage, but then, as I told you, thinkers only make an impact by wild exaggeration, and Master goes further than most. Let me read you this particular passage once again in order to convey to you the kind of flavor, the kind of feeling which Mester had and the sort of thing with which he tended to shock the rather conventional court of Cagliari. I've already told you about the fact that it seems to be mysterious that we respect soldiers, not just because they take risks or because they risk their lives or because they have nice characters, and don't respect the executioner who performs the most useful of all social functions. He goes on. Who is this inexplicable being who, when there are so many agreeable, lucrative, honest, and even honorable professions to choose among, in which a man can exercise his skill or his powers, has chosen that of torturing or killing his own kind? This head, this heart, are they made like our own? 
Is there not something in them that is peculiar and alien to our nature? Myself, I have no doubt about this. He is made like us externally. He is born like all of us. But he is an extraordinary being, and it needs a special decree to bring him into existence as a member of the human family, a fiat of the creative power. Hardly is he assigned to his proper dwelling place, hardly has he been, has he been put in possession of it, when others remove their homes elsewhere, whence they can no longer see him. In the midst of this desolation, in this sort of vacuum formed round him, he lives alone with his mate and his young, who alone acquaint him with the sound of the human voice, without which he would hear nothing but groans. The gloomy signal is given. An abject servitor of justice knocks on his door to tell him he is wanted. He goes. He arrives in a public square covered by a dense, trembling mob. A poisoner, a parricide, a man who has committed sacrilege is tossed to him. He seizes him, stretches him, ties him to a horizontal cross, lifts his arms. There is a horrible silence. There is no sound but that of bones cracking under the bars and the shrieks of the victim. He unties him. He puts him on the wheel. The shattered limbs are entangled in the spokes. The head hangs down, the hair stands up. And the mouth gaping open like a furnace from time to time emits only a few bloodstained words to beg for death. The executioner has finished. His heart is beating, but it is with joy. He congratulates himself. He says in his heart, nobody quarters nearly as well as I. He steps down. He holds out his blood-stained hand, and there is thrown to him from a distance a few pieces of gold, a few, there are thrown to him from a distance a few pieces of gold which he catches through a double row of human beings, stiff with horror. He sits down to table and he eats. He goes to bed and he sleeps. And on the next day, when he wakes, he thinks of something totally different from what he did the day before. Is he a man? Yes. God receives him in his temples and allows him to pray. He is not a criminal. Nevertheless, no tongue dare declare that he is virtuous, that he is an honest man, that he is estimable. No moral praise is appropriate to him. For everyone else is assumed to have relations with human beings. He has none. And yet all greatness, all power, all subordination rests on him and him alone. He is the terror and he is the bond of human association. Remove this mysterious agent from the world and in an instant order yields to chaos. Thrones fall, society disappears. God, who has created sovereignty, has also made punishment. He has fixed the earth upon two poles, for Jehovah is master of the twin poles, and upon them he maketh turn the world. Kings 1, 2, 8. It is a typical mainstream passage, and all he means, because I don't think he ever did see an execution of doing any of these things, if the biographers are to be trusted, all that Maestro really means is something of this sort. No man can exist without society. No society exists without some degree of sovereignty. All sovereignty implies infallibility, and infallibility rests with God. Therefore the Pope. <coughs> Therefore, the Pope must be the master of mankind. This is the root and, uh, and, and center of Maestro's ultramontanism. And the whole passage about the executioner is simply a highly dramatized way of saying that unless there, is, there are sanctions, unless there is punishment, man will sin, man will rip other men to pieces. His imagination swings between two extremes. On one side, extreme punishment. On one side, terror. On the other side, chaos, roughly speaking. And that is really what the French Revolution certainly did induce in him. And yet, he certainly doesn't believe, for example, in military government. He wants government to be traditional, he wants government to be ancient, he wants government to be established, and he wants it to be established in the poetry, the mythology, the imagination, the tradition, the irrational, so to speak, uh, uh, creative faculties of man, his mythological and his poetical self, not some kind of fiat, not some kind of artificial Hobbesian sovereign. He is, for example, against what he calls bat batonocracy, or rule of the stick. So long as I live, he says, I, have, I, have, I shall always hate military government. I've always hated it, I hate it now. His attitude towards Napoleon, for example, was ambiguous. On the one hand, he was, of course, the Corsican monster. He was a usurper. 
He was a man who performed an act of utmost blasphemy by the hideous coronation to which he forced the Pope, by which he forced the Pope to crown him, on the one hand. He drove out the legitimate rulers of France. On the other hand, all power is from God, and Napoleon has power, and power is important. And Mason lays down a proposition which didn't make him down particularly popular in Cagliari. He says, no doubt the Jacobins were terrible people, but they saved France. No doubt the Jacobins were the scourge of God sent upon us. But in the chaos of France, induced by the philosophes and Voltaire, he says, it's quite right, books have done it all. It's these pamphlets of the philosophes which are really responsible for the dreadful disintegration of this great country. In this particular situation, at least the Jacobins cut off heads. Anyone who cuts off heads asserts authority. Anyone who asserts authority establishes order. And therefore, the Jacobins are greater heroes in French history than Louis XVI, who was feeble and who played with liberals. Louis XIV crushed liberals, issued the Edict of Nantes, expelled the great many Protestants, and died glorious in his bed. Louis XVI was liberal, played with the liberals, encouraged democracy, and we all know how he ended. Robespierre is a monster, he says, drunk with power and blood. Nevertheless, he was the instrument chosen by history to rescue, the French, to rescue France and, and, and defend her frontiers against external invasion. All power is always better than no power, and therefore Mester is among the earliest, earliest European thinkers, quite firmly, to establish the proposition that all power is to be worshipped. All power is admirable. Every form of human coercion has for its end the preservation of that degree of minimum human order without which men become sinful, become chaotic, and become self-destructive. And the fact that he should have said this about the Jacobins, as I said, did not endear him to his um, royalist colleagues. He wanted to meet Napoleon, and he wrote to the court at Cagliari saying, he wished to meet him because Napoleon had expressed a desire to meet him. Napoleon was fascinated by his works, thought he had the root of the matter in him, and on the whole wished to meet this intelligent and interesting and counter revolutionary. He wrote to the court, the court was extremely shocked. The king wrote back and said that on no account could he conceive that the loyal subject of his could possibly meet the bloodstained usurper. Mester wrote back saying, I shall always be loyal to your majesty. I shall never contravene any order you gave me. And if you forbid me to meet Napoleon, I shall never meet him. But you confess yourself surprised by my attitude. Not to surprise you, I cannot promise. And this is the kind of dispatch which made the court of Cagliari regard him as a somewhat uncomfortable ally. <laughs> Towards the end of his life, Mester published uh, or rather wrote the Constitution of St. Petersburg, which were published, in fact, after his death. And they became a kind of Bible to what might be called non-Christian Catholics in France. That is to say, the proportion of Christianity in Mester's writings cannot be regarded as high. He pretends that he derives his propositions from St. Thomas. He pretends that he derives his propositions from all kinds of forms of scholastic logic or the doctrines of the Roman Church. But in fact, of course, as one can see from the quotations which I've given, which are not at all uncharacteristic, he is not what he is usually represented in the histories of political thought to be. He is not a proud, indomitable aristocrat, standing on the frontiers of the 18th and 19th century, looking back towards some kind of imaginary past, a tragic figure, resisting change which is inevitable, uh, dignified, blind, reactionary, a kind of classical profile of the last patrician about to be knocked down by the furious bourgeois mob. That is a normal uh, view of him, even by those who favor him. Uh, the last of the Romans, as it were. Um, we see Faguet says he is like a Roman of the 5th century before the invasion, before the final invasion overthrew them. This is, the general notion is that he's somehow out of date, uh, that he is the last defender of a completely outworn order, a man um, tragically um, concentrated upon partly imaginary but certainly no longer restorable past. This I believe to be a false account. 
the master is far more a harbinger, a loss of the future, than he seems, than he seems to me to be in any sense a reconstructor of the past. The hysteria of his writings, the dwelling on blood, the view of man as possessed by irrational instincts, the darkness, the, the proposition that it is fundamentally the irrational and the, um, un, so to speak, uncontrollable, which is in charge of men. The view that the analysis of the encyclopedists is shallow because they don't take account of the human desire for self-immolation, for human desire for destruction, for the whole bundle of irrational impulses of which man is to a large extent composed, and the proposition that only by in some way exploiting these, certainly by taking notice of them, but also in some way by directing them, by canalizing them, by disciplining them, by making use of them, but above all, by looking them in the face, that only in this way can human society survive. The extreme contempt for liberals and democrats, the view that human beings are totally unfit to govern themselves, the view that human beings must always be governed by small oligarchical elites, which must be self a group of self-sacrificing men s trying to tie up this terrible tiger, so to speak, with the utmost effort, which gives them no pleasure at all any more than gives to the executioner, any more than the executioner takes pleasure in his executions. The notion that human society can only persist if a few self-sacrificing men are just able to rein in this monstrous beast, this and must do so by appealing not to his rational self, which is weak, but to his irrational self, which is dominant, and must in some way direct it towards ends not intelligible to him, but intelligible to those who direct him. This view, which is, a great, which is of course the view of the Grand Inquisitor in Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov, doesn't appear to me to be an 18th century view at all, neither progressive nor reactionary, neither liberal nor conservative, certainly very remote from Burke, by whom he was supposed to be inspired, and totally unrelated to termism, termism or the official Catholic political philosophy of that, or in the official of any other time. And in this respect, I think he is a proto-fascist. I think it's reasonable to say that the particular stress upon what might be called the seamy side, upon the black side of human nature, does qualify him to be so described. That, I think, is his vision. Let me try and sum him up, finally. His merits are that he is genuinely capable of seeing through hollow abstractions. That he is genuinely capable of understanding the role which myths and the irrational play in human life. That he understands among, that among the motives which move men is this desire for self-immolation, is the desire for aggression, is the desire for self-destruction, which is as much part of human history as the nobler and more rational impulses to which the uh, encyclopedists appealed. He understands, in other words, all the things which, kept, or which the fascist psychologists were able, in fact, to exploit to a successful degree. In short, if we only read the encyclopedists, we, should, we ought to be unable to explain the phenomenon of the fascism. If we read the master, we can at least explain it, whatever our attitude towards it might be. He contradicts himself a thousand times. He says, for example, that all constitutions uh, must be lived, they cannot be written because whatever is written perishes, and therefore the English constitution is the best because it's not been written down. And everything which is written down in laws and enactments must perish because this is done by human intelligence, by clerks, by people who use um, the feeble categories of the human intellect instead of, so to speak, thinking with the blood, which is very strongly enmeshed. Well, he says that. On the other hand, he also tells you that the Turks have survived so long because they've all believed in the Quran that the Chinese have survived so long because they repeat the epiphagms of Confucius, which presumably are written down, that the Christianity has survived for so long because it has dedicated itself to the eternal truths of the Bible. These two propositions are not compatible with one another. He says that the only countries which own the true faith, only Catholic countries can survive because only in Catholic countries is authority understood. Elsewhere, mutinies break out, Calvin, Luther, these are the real authors of the French Revolution, the people who trusted in individual judgment. On the other hand, he agrees that England appears fairly stable to him in his day. And he says, it's a miracle. It's a miracle because, <laughs> it's, and, and the definition of a miracle is something which contradicts something which on other grounds one knows to be universally true, which again is not the most powerful of arguments. 
um, to regard something as miraculous merely because you've taken something to be a law which the exception in fact refutes is not the most powerful of logical instruments. <laughs> and there are many other contradictions of a similar type, which, which I needn't go into, uh, which are relatively unimportant. The general pattern of his views is fairly clear. What can be said about the master is that he violently and vastly exaggerated, which is precisely what I've tried to say about Harman too. That if it were true that men were, as he describes them as being, that if all we had in the world was crime and punishment, that if men always oscillated either between the most ghastly and bloodstained terror on the one hand, which was the only instrument which prevented them from total self-demolition and chaos on the other, then human history is even more unintelligible than he thinks Voltaire makes it out to be. And therefore, that his psychology and his sociology are just as lopsided as that of the most superficial, the most rosy spectacled, the most idealistic and starry-eyed of the idealists of the 18th century whom he regards with such contempt and hatred. But I think this can be said for the master, that he did attack people's attention to what might be called the black aspects of individual and psychological uh, and, and, and social life. That if rational behavior is to occur at all, then reality must be looked at as it is and not as it is desired. And that in a certain sense, if self-understanding is of any importance, then Mester undoubtedly did bring out in a manner which was really extremely bold and unusual in his day, those huge socially irrational factors which afterwards people like Marx and Freud wrote about. Those aspects of human life which certainly were not suspected or dreamt of in most of the writings of the 18th century. And in this respect, he did render a service to mankind. That is to say, after Mester, it was no longer possible to write about social life as it was written about in the 18th century. And it wasn't only the French Revolution which did that, because we find a great deal of writing uh, on the part of people like Court, on the part of people like um, Fourier, for example, even, or certainly on the part of people like Macaulay, even on the part of people like John Stuart Mill, which takes no notice of these things or takes very little notice of them. And in this respect, when you read Mestre, and when you read one of these tragic and violent and hysterical and, and, and sometimes fantastic descriptions of human folly or human degradation or human misery or human irrationality on which he stresses, you feel that you are reading a far more contemporary authors author than if you are reading Macaulay, or if you are reading um, uh, Mill, or if you are reading Fourier, or any of the other authors, either contemporary with or uh, shortly after uh, De Maistre. And in this sense, he is a kind of modern thinker. He is a modern thinker because he really did rip open certain aspects of social reality, which certainly were only hinted at obscurely before, and were certainly never presented with the harshness and the vivacious and dramatic force which Aiden in, in Mason was able to impart them. That, I think, is ultimately his service. He's regarded by most French writers on him as a marvelous and logical mind capable of deducing all kinds of extremely paradoxical and disagreeable propositions by ironclad logic from very lucid premises. This is, seems to me totally false. There is not much logic in Mester. There is not much argument. All there is is a vivacious imagination and an extreme desire to show up and expose the enemy. The enemy is Voltaire, the enemy is Rousseau, the enemy is Holbach, the enemy is Helvetius, Condillac and Condorcet. Whenever you come across their writings, he writes with a kind of dramatic violence and a kind of passion which really does, in a way, arm, him, arm his sight with a kind of special hatred which is also a, a quality which I attributed to Harman, which really does, in a certain sense, throw a kind of gloomy light upon a scene not perhaps adequately illuminated by the more rational and the more benevolent thinkers. Now, as a final word, let me say both in the case of Harman and in the case of Meister, that importance resides in two things. First of all, in revealing what might be called irrational, chaotic, disagreeable, aspects of both individual and social existence not taken care of in the symmetrical and rationalistic, I won't say rational, but at any rate in the elegant constructions of the 
of the typical 18th century enlightenment. That is one. And the second proposition is that both these men had a considerable influence upon behavior and deserve study as such. Hamann, in the particular note of irrationality which he injected into German Romanticism and by direction of various uh, movements that grew out of it, various forms of nationalism and so forth, which grew out of it and Meister by uh, painting a picture of man which thereupon became the vademecum of every reactionary and indeed every fascist movement in the world. One final remark I wish to make. The St. Simonian movement in 1830 rather mysteriously observed the St. Simonian Exposition said what is really desired is a combination of Voltaire and de Mestre. This, on the face of it, seems somewhat paradoxical. Voltaire, the friend of light, the friend of liberty, the friend of man, the master of the executioner, blood, darkness, irrationality, horror. What they meant was not altogether absurd. They wanted to say that Voltaire was a very dry and ironical thinker who thought poorly of mankind and on the whole was not sentimental. He stripped away good many illusions. Man, as he painted him, was not entirely attractive. No doubt his persecutors were even less so. But man, on the whole, as painted by Voltaire, was a fairly, uh, it was a dry etching. And he removed from him all kinds of handsome um, attributes with which more optimistic or more charitable thinkers had clothed him before. This man needed some kind of advice about how to proceed. Mester provided the kind of machinery with which this poor creature, as drawn by Voltaire, could alone be governed. What I think none of these things had foreseen was the possibility of the combination of irrationalism and science. For Mester, of course, science is the opposite of irrationalism, and therefore anyone who is scientific is, in some sense, bound to disintegrate um, the country in which he lives by resisting or not allowing to grow those healthy irrational forces around which society uh, must grow as a tree. But the proposition that irrational movements, nationalism, chauvinism, totalitarianism of the right or the left, can come armed with science is a particular um, nightmare which even Mester never dreamt of. Nevertheless, he did provide the material out of which ultimately it could be constructed.